Welcome to Hope City Church. This is a place where you don't have to have it all together. Where it's okay to not be okay. We're all in the same boat. That's why we gather every Sunday, because we believe Jesus gives us a better way to do life. This is a place where we can connect and grow in our faith, where we are challenged to not settle for complacency. Where we pursue grace and truth with a desire to become more like Jesus. Our ultimate hope is to be a place where we bump into Jesus and experience His life-changing hope. This hope changes our families. This hope changes our workplaces and cities. This hope changes you, and this hope changes me. This hope is for everyone. Uh, like Ashley just said, we're in week two of this series called Struggle Bus, where we've been going through uh, the book of Philippians. So if you have your phones or Bibles like to follow along, you can go and turn to Philippians chapter two. That's where we're going to be today. Uh, but man, let me catch us up. Uh, if you weren't here last week, or maybe this is your first week in here, uh, you can get the full uh, sermon. We post those every week online at hopefornwa.city. But I just want to make sure we're all on the same page here uh, this morning as we jump into this. Uh, at different points in our lives, right? Like we can all find ourselves on the struggle bus. Anybody like there right now? Yeah, it's okay. You can raise your hand around here. We're all in the same boat. Me too. All right. Yeah, me too. And and, uh, here's the really good news that we talked about last week. God does his best work. He does his best work in and through jacked up on the struggle bus people like you and me. Uh, That's just the truth. That's what what he's chosen to do across history. And and if we're going to enter into this struggle together, the way that Paul encouraged the Philippians to do last week and the way that we're encouraging ourselves to do, man, here's something that we're going to have to lean into. All right. It's going to get messy. Right? If we're going to be on the struggle bus together, it's going to get messy. And here's why. Because I'm on the bus, and I'm kind of a mess. And you guys are on the bus, and I'm going to be honest, you're kind of a mess too, all right? Uh, just about once a day, my wife Ashley, she'll look at me after I say or do something, and she just kind of rolls her eyes, and she's like, what is wrong with you? Because I am a mess, right? And, and like relationships, man, maybe you find yourself in like relational mess or, or f- like a mess of faith. You're trying to sort out what's right and what's true, what's best. And may- maybe it's mental health or physical health. It's just messy right now. Uh, or addiction and recovery. If you've ever been through those, man, it's messy. Uh, parenting, it's the definition of a mess, right? Like all the time, like life is just messy. And here's what's true. I, I know this because it's true for me and I think it's true for you too. Um, we're okay with our own mess, right? But when other people's mess starts to make our life a mess, that's not all right. Like when it starts to jack with our schedules or our plans or our families, or how about this? When their sin starts to affect us, that's not so much fun, is it? But here's the reality. God uses being on the struggle bus, entering into the struggle together and the mess that comes along with it. That's what he chooses to use to grow our faith. That's what he uses to grow our faith. Uh, when Ash and I first got married, we lived next door to some really messy people. Uh, there were fights and, and abuse situations. They were dealing drugs from the house next door. Like it was a mess. But, but in the middle of their mess, Jesus was actually changing us. He, he asked us to start doing something really simple. He, he asked us to start mowing their grass. And over time, not only did it start to change our lives, but it started to change them too, the way that they interacted with each other and us. But but if I could tell you, the the best change that happened was was in us because Jesus was teaching us how to love messy neighbors as we loved ourselves. That's what he asked us to do, right? And and then when we lived in Indiana, uh, also we we lived in a different neighborhood. A a local middle school asked my brother-in-law and I if we could come in and uh, if we could jump in once a week with this class of kids that they all put in the same class because they like all got in trouble all the time. So they're like, we'll just isolate them over here in the same class and the trouble will be here. It was a mess. Let me tell you, like it, every, every Tuesday we went in, it was like, who knows who's gonna get in a fight or whatever's gonna go on that day. Um, but over time, we came to find out that another one of our neighbors, her, her son was in that class. And as we were getting ready to move from that neighborhood to go to Colorado through tears, um, she asked me, she was like, why, why do you guys show up every week? Why, why'd you go to the school? And I was like, well, we want to build relationships with the kids. She goes, no, 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 why do you really go? And I was like, well, eventually they get to experience Jesus and they ask us about him. And then through tears again, uh, she goes, did my son ever ask? Because she wanted him to get to know Jesus. In Colorado, getting into the mess of someone else's life meant fighting to create an environment in our church that my friend Calvin could walk into. Calvin was tattooed from the neck down and he had Weed King tattooed across his knuckles. 
Over time, he came to follow Jesus and he was baptized. And a few months later, he took me uh, to his office. He picked me up at home in his work truck and he's like, hey, I wanna show you my, my office because I want you to know I'm no longer the weed king. Jesus is changing my life. And now I'm a boss who gets to care for his employees. And I, I'm a dad who's protecting, and providing for my family. And I'm helping everyone everywhere get to know Jesus. I, I remember my friend Lee that came into our church back in Indiana looking for financial assistance. And in the middle of that conversation, I, I ended up catching him in a lie. And he broke down and he started crying. He's like, man, I'm, I'm on the edge of attempting suicide right now. And we started spending some time together uh, over the next several months. And um, Lee ended up going off the deep end. He, he got arrested for some like pretty nasty stuff. And, and I'm going to be honest, I was just angry. You ever have somebody burn you when you're trying to like invest your life in them and you're like, man, I'm done. So I didn't answer a call that came through from the prison system. Um, I, I, I was done with them. I quit on them. Then a couple years later, uh, I get a call from the Indiana Department of Corrections, and for whatever reason that night, I called or I answered it, and it, it was Lee. He was calling to tell me the impact that Jesus had made on his life through me, and how in prison he'd come to follow Jesus, and now he was leading a prison ministry. That, that phone call changed my life. His life was changed, but it changed my life by entering into his mess. Hope City, it's why we started this church. We know that we're on the struggle bus, right? We know that we're a work in progress and we wanna to attempt to break down every barrier and boundary between people and Jesus because we believe he's our only hope. And when you start a community like this, when you create a community like this and you make spe space for people like us, guess what? It's gonna get messy, right? And, and I'll tell you all those stories not to make you go, oh, hey, Adam, uh, you're such a good pastor. Like, we love you. No, that's not why I tell you all those stories. I tell you that because I want you to know that this life of following Jesus means that we're gonna enter into the struggle bus together. And we're gonna get messy when we do this together and we do it for real. And so today we're gonna to look at one of the most important passages, I think, in, in the whole Bible, Philippians chapter two, because in this passage, we're gonna find out not only who Jesus is and what he's done for us, but we're gonna learn his heart for people like us, people who are on the struggle bus. Uh, Jesus, he entered into our struggle and our mess and he's gonna show us how to live out our faith together in a really practical way today. And he's actually gonna show us what it means to be human like who we were created to be. Now, I wanna warn some of you up front today, it's gonna to be a challenge, all right? We're gonna get messy today. And at the end, I'm gonna ask us all to do something really practical and jump into this mess called Hope City together. Uh, if this is your church, I'm gonna give you a heads up. If Hope City is your church, we are gonna ask you at the end of today, if you are not currently volunteering or serving somewhere, it's time to get off the bench and it's time to get in the game. It is time to help make this community the place and space where you've gotten to experience Jesus' work in your life, and you've got to help create that for other people so that we can continue in our messy lives to experience the hope and healing of Jesus. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, therefore, because of everything we talked about last week, because of this new life that we have in Jesus, because we're in this struggle together, Paul says, he, he says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if you have any common sharing in the Spirit, if any, tenderness and compassion. Now, we read this and we think that these are like hypotheticals because Paul says if, right? But, but that word if better translates since. What, what he's saying is since you have encouragement from being united in Christ, since you're on the struggle bus together, since you have comfort in the struggle from his love, since God has given you his spirit, think about that, like you have the spirit of the God that created the universe living inside you. Since you've experienced his tenderness and compassion, Here's how you should live, Paul says. Now, notice something. He doesn't start out like right out of the gate and go, here's all the things I need you to do, right? He, he doesn't give you the list of things that you have to clean up before you come to Jesus. He doesn't go, hey, do this to earn your way back to God. No, he reminds them of who they already are because of their faith in Jesus. And then out of who they are because of Jesus, Paul's gonna go, here's how you live this life. Here, here's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Verse two, he says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love and being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish amb ambition or vain conceit, rather in what? In humility, value others above yourselves. That's messy, isn't it? Like, like that's messy. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Pastor Tim Keller, he defines humility this way. He, he says, humility is not being selfless. It's thinking of yourself less. It's learning not to look at your own interests, but to the interest of others. It's learning to be like-minded, 
Because when someone else's interests succeed, you're of the same mind, like so much so that it feels like you're succeeding. It's having the same love and spirit. And we are, as followers of Jesus, we're, we're, we're to be such for each other kinds of people that when one person wins, it feels like we're all winning, right? And Paul goes, here's where, we, where it begins. It begins with humility. And this would have been a foreign concept for Paul's readers. Remember, Philippi was in modern day Greece and it was occupied by the Roman Empire. And the Greeks, they didn't even have a word for humility. Like, like it was a foreign concept for them because their culture was all about self. And for the Romans, humility would have been like repulsive and despised because it was like a survival of the fittest, who can be the strongest kind of culture. It, it, it was a word that was literally invented when Jesus came on the scene. I mean, think about that. What, what Paul is proposing here was a completely countercultural way of life. Even today, it's a completely countercultural way of living, isn't it? I, I, I mean, we're, we're Razorback fans, right? And Lord, it's hard to be humble, isn't it? Isn't that how the song goes? And in a world that's all about influence and likes on social media, selfies, self-promotion, self-help, self-worth, find your own truth, live your own life, humility actually asks us to do the opposite of that and take our eyes off of ourselves and place them on Jesus. It asks us to look at him and what he did and what he cared about. And man, what we're going to find is that if we're willing to do that, it's going to get messy. Because Jesus, think about it, he willingly left the perfection of heaven to enter into our mess. Verse two, or verse five, I'm sorry. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset. Meaning this, think about life the same way as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself by taking on the nature of a what? A servant. And being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. How? By becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, see what Paul's writing about here is something that everyone in the Philippian church would have been familiar with. Uh, these verses follow a, a common structure for ancient Greek poetry. And many people believe that these few verses made up like the, the early like foundation or confession of faith that these early followers of Jesus would have recited together whenever they got together. They're like, hey, re remember Jesus. Here's how he lived, and here's how we should live. Um, this is one of the most important passages in, in, in uh, Scripture in the Bible because it not only shows us who Jesus is and what he's done for us, but it lets us behind the scenes. It opens up the curtain into his mindset and his attitude and why he came into our mess to begin with. The first thing it shows us is this. Jesus came into our world to show us who God is and what he's like. He came into our world to show us who God is and what he's like. Paul says that, that Jesus being in very nature, God, and that word God, it's the, the, or, or nature, it's the Greek word morphe, which means like very essence or, or the exact same qualities. Like, like Paul's saying, don't miss this because Jesus like really is God. He, he always has been. He always will be God. He, he didn't consider though equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Uh, that means like to be grasped or held onto. He let go of it. So if you want to know who God is and what he's like, man, you got to get to know Jesus. You got to get to know Jesus. I mean, think about it. Jesus didn't come into this world to use us, but to love us. He, he didn't come to get anything from us, but instead to give everything of himself to us. He, he didn't come to meet his own needs. He didn't need anything. No, he came to meet our needs. He's the God who turned water into wine for his friends at a party. He's the God who walked on water to rescue his friends caught in a storm. He's the God who came into the world and said, man, I came to proclaim the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom to the captives, the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's our God. He's the God who made himself nothing and who became a servant. Man, if you want to know who God is, Look at Jesus, because he's in very essence, very nature, God. But he didn't stop there, because Jesus actually came into the world to model for us what it means to be human. He, he took on the form of a servant. Verse 7, rather, he, he emptied himself, took on the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Again, human likeness, that's the Greek word morphe. He took on the very essence of humanity. He's fully God, always has been, always will be, but he, he became fully man when he entered this world. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
I love the way that John, one of Jesus' best friends while he was here on this earth, describes it. And I love the way that the message paraphrase puts this. Uh, John says, when I saw my friend Jesus, this is what I got to experience. The word Jesus became flesh and blood and he did what? He moved into the neighborhood. I, I mean, can you picture that? Like there's so much emotion in that. Uh, what kind of neighbor do you think Jesus would be if he moved in down the street from you? Uh, if he moved in next door, like what would you start to notice around the neighborhood? What kinds of people would show up in your neighborhood? You know what Jesus was most often accused of by the religious crowd? They, they got all like mad at him because they said, man, you, you hang out with and you eat and drink with like tax collectors and sinners. And by eating and drinking with them, Jesus was calling them friends. Like, like Jesus, when he came into this world, he, he, he came and hung out with messy people. And he was willing to empty himself. He, he got on the struggle bus. And he took on our mess because we are those messy people. He came to show us who God is and what he's like. And ultimately, he showed us a model to follow in what it means to be human. See, see ultimately, it's Jesus' claim to be God and the people he hung out with that got him nailed to a cross because what people saw in Jesus was so human. Does that make sense? I, I mean, think about it. Jesus took on flesh and blood and he moved in next door. And when he did, he voluntarily chose to leave the perfection of heaven to live here like us. And, and in his life, he suffered just like you. He, he knows what it's like to be lonely. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He, he knows what it's like to have your prayers turned down and God go, hey, we're not gonna do it that way. He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to die. He understands you on a deeper level than you could ever know. And he overcame all of that so that we can look to him to help us and show us how to live this human life. So my guess is you probably walked in here this morning um, because you're trying to figure some things out, right? Anybody trying to figure some stuff out about life and maybe, maybe spirituality following Jesus? And, and, and my guess is you don't have it all figured out. So what you're asking questions, it looks like this. Um, Jesus, is this stuff really true? And, and if it is true, does it apply to my life? And if it does apply to my life, how do I live it out? And how do I grow spiritually? How, how do I look different because of what you've done in my direction? Because if we're honest, I mean, we often find ourselves on the struggle bus, right? And we're kind of a mess. So can Jesus really transform us? Can he really change our lives? And does he actually offer us a better way to do life? And that answer is yes, absolutely. What Paul is writing to here, uh, to his friends in Philippi, is not only is Jesus a better way to do life, but, but he's the way to be made right with God. He's the way to be transformed. He's the model and example to us of what it means to live a life that looks like him. Let's take a look at how we can be changed by Jesus. It starts here. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same what? Mindset as Christ. Attitude. You got to think about life the way Jesus thinks about life. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be held on to. Go ahead and hit that next slide. He didn't consider equality with God something to be held on to. Often we try to set ourselves up to be our own gods, don't we? Like, God, I got this. I, I know what I need to do. Thanks for the advice, but I'm good. I'll, I'll live my truth. No, instead, Jesus let go of that right, and he entered into our world. He humbled himself, and he emptied himself of any right or power. In fact, he thought less of himself. And as he did through him, God did some amazingly powerful things, right? He took on the form of a servant, Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to be served, but to serve. And when we consider or think about, take on the mindset of Jesus, th think about this. Jesus, by giving up power and glory, by choosing to come serve, by humbling himself and making himself completely dependent on his heavenly father to work in and through him, Jesus in his humanity had far more power than you and I ever have when we try to hang on to our own power and glory. Jesus let go of it, and so he was given it. It's an upside-down way of thinking. We have to change our minds. So how can Jesus transform us? Well, we take on his nature, right? He became a servant. See, when you sign up to follow Jesus, you're given this gift. And it's the Spirit of God, the creator of the universe, living inside you. And so what may now feel impossible, you're like, I don't know how I can live like Jesus. It's now possible because the Spirit is living in you. Because, because the, the Holy Spirit is inside you, it's now possible through his power to live our human lives like Jesus lived his human life. I, I've heard it said this way, how would Jesus live your life if it were his? 
How would he be married to your spouse? How would he parent your kids? How would he live in your neighborhood? How, how would he go to your job or, or go to your school? How, how would he deal with your financial or health situation? I mean, yeah, we may be on the struggle bus, but Hope City, don't miss this. We've got the spirit of the living God inside of us. I mean, anything's possible now, right? But here's the reality. God cannot steer a parked bus. If you want to sit on the sidelines, he'll let you do it. But if you want to be transformed, we actually have to take steps in his direction. We have to take on the mindset of Jesus. We have to take on the form of a servant. And that's where God works powerfully in and through us to transform us into the people he created us to be. And if you want to do that, you're going to become who you were created to be, who you want to be in this life. But I can promise you it's going to get messy. Because think about it, we've got a God who entered straight into our mess to bring us into his glory. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says that the, the end result of all of this is that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here's the deal. You've got the opportunity to humble yourself now and to be exalted and let Jesus be exalted. Or you can wait till later and it's going to happen anyway. It's just a choice now on how you want to live your life. Do you want to live out your human existence like Jesus is present with you every day? Or you just kind of want to do it on your own? Here's the bottom line. When people who follow Jesus start to live like Jesus, the world gets to experience who? Jesus. You know what our world doesn't need more of? It doesn't need more religion. It also doesn't need more politics. We don't need more social media influencers. We don't need more self-help. We don't need more money. No, no, what our world needs is people who are willing to empty themselves, uh, to take on the form of servants, to roll up our sleeves and get messy. And, and not only will we be transformed to look more like Jesus now, but the world will get a picture of Jesus that they cannot deny. And my guess is you probably want to live in a world like that. Jesus goes and starts with you. So what gets in the way? I, I mean, this sounds like a world I'd rather get, live in, but what makes it so hard to let Jesus live our human lives? Well, it's messy, right? It's the mundane stuff in life. It's my kid's schedule. It's my financial restraints. It's, it's laundry. It's dishes. It's mowing the grass. It's my own energy level. But, but remember, like my story earlier, mowing the grass was actually one of the places God chose to transform my life. So what does God want to teach you in the mundane stuff of life? How, how does Jesus want to teach you to live like him by changing a diaper or mowing the grass? How can Jesus transform you they're taking time to play with your kids. How is Jesus working through your life while you're doing the dishes? Like Jesus wants to transform us through the mundane everyday stuff of life, through the servant kind of, kind of stuff. Uh, the other thing that can keep us from this is, uh, this is a reality we talked about last week, but man, we have a spiritual enemy who wants nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy everything good that God wants for your life. And so he's gonna get in the way of God transforming you into the image of Jesus. Why? Because he, he wants to hide that part of your life from the world. So he'll whisper lies like this. See if this makes sense to you. I've, I've heard these. You're too busy. Or, or what difference could you really make? Or man, you're a mess. You have to take care of yourself first. Clean yourself up, then God can use you. It's a straight up lie. Or, or how about this? If God were really in this, then why would it be so hard? I believe that lie. Or how about this? Don't humble yourself. Actually, make much of yourself. The real way to make a difference in this world is through social media, media followers or having a bigger office, a bigger budget, a better job. Like make much of yourself, then you can transform the world. That's a lie though. It's a straight up lie from the enemy. How do we know that? Because it's not the way of Jesus. It's not what he modeled for us. See, when people who follow Jesus start to live like Jesus, the world gets to experience Jesus. And you know who's in the world? You and me. So you wanna grow in your faith? Take a step. Start serving, taking on the mindset of Jesus. And here's how this works. Verse 12, Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, like taking what Jesus said and actually putting it into practice, not, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Remember, Paul's in prison in Rome for his faith in Jesus. He says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act to fulfill his good purpose. So work out your salvation. What, what Paul didn't say there is work for your salvation. It's already done. Like there's grace for that. You don't, have to, you don't have to move an inch to be saved by the grace of God. All you have to do is believe. 
But what Paul's saying is that if you want to take what you believe about Jesus and actually put it into practice, you got to work it out. And, and that may better translate like work out of. Work out of the knowledge of what Jesus has already done in you and for you. Work out of the encouragement that you have from him. Uh, work out of the unity that you experience in Jesus. Uh, work out of the comfort that you have from his love. Work out of his spirit. Work, work out of the power of God living in you. Work, work out of the tenderness and the compassion that he's shown you. And his promise is this, that as you take those first steps, he'll meet you in that moment. Because it's God who works in you, Right? To do what? To will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And that word will, it, it's desire. Like God can actually change your desires as you start to move in his direction. And that word act, it's power. Like God will give you the power for everything he places in front of you. And that's to fulfill his good purpose. As you step towards Jesus and you start to live like him, you actually start to find the life you were created for. When people who follow Jesus start to live like Jesus... The world gets to experience Jesus. So how do we do that? Well, this fall, we're going to start talking about like really zoning in on what does it mean to be part of Hope City? Now, our mission is to help people experience Jesus in a way that will change their lives and impact generations with this hope. And if this is your church, man, it's time to jump in. If you've been, we're a new church, so if you've been here for like more than a month, this is your church, all right? But if, you, if somebody stops you on the street and they're like, hey, where do you go to church? And you're like, Hope City, and that would roll off your tongue, this is your church. And it's time to get off the bench and it's time to get in the game. So we're going to talk about generosity. Did you know that one in six times Jesus opened his mouth? He talked about money. And he said the biggest indicator of our trust in him, our faith in him, is what we do with our money. My guess is, if I were to ask you, what's your biggest stressor in life? What are you going to tell me? Money, right? So does Jesus have a better way to do life when it comes to our finances? Probably, right? Or how about this? How about serving? Je Jesus took on the form of a servant. And if we want the world to experience Jesus in a way that will change our lives, man, how can we help the world experience him by living like him through how we serve? And, and then we're going to talk about community and living this life together. Like Jesus did not go through this life alone. He didn't enter into the struggle alone. He actually had a, a close group of 12 friends in his circle. And we need people in our circle to become who God created us to be. Uh, but today I want to challenge you just to take your next step. All right? I just want to challenge you to take your next step. Coming up on August 27th, Ashley talked about it. We have starting point at 1145. And this is for anyone who wants to learn more about who we are as a church around here. Uh, this is also for somebody that goes, man, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to jump in. Like, show me where to go. I'm just not start, sure where to start. This is your next step. And so we've got a sign-up sheet in the back. And this is an opportunity to jump in and, and get to experience what Jesus wants to do in your life through this church and help other people get to experience him as well. So please, just take that first step. We'll feed you lunch. And if you don't want to jump in after starting point, that's fine. Like, we're good, all right? But take a step. And, and if you've never been, even if you've been around here for a long time and you've never been to starting point, come to starting point on the 27th, all right? The second thing is this. Man, serve survey Hope City. Um, we have a lot of people that have invested a lot of, I mean, literally, sweat, blood, and tears into creating the space that you're sitting in right now. And if God has done anything good in your life through this church, it, it, it's time for you to help create that same space for other people. If you're not serving, we have a need right now for 40 volunteers across the board. And what this would do is it would help share the load and make this sustainable. I, I know that we're not going to get 40 people to jump in right now, but really what this looks like is if we had 10 right now that would jump in on our City Life team and help eliminate every possible barrier between people and Jesus, I mean, that would spread out the load an awful lot. And I think we would continue to become the, the church that God intends us to be. Uh, if we had eight people who would be willing to serve in city kids, what, one out of every three weeks, and help the next generation get to know and follow Jesus, man, what difference would that make? You want to know whose responsibility it is to hand off faith to the next generation? You're looking at them, right? Us. We, we need five to 10 people who'd be willing to jump in on our worship life team to help set up this room and create environments where people get to experience Jesus, to maybe play in the band, to help run slides in the back, and to create engaging environments where we get to experience Jesus do his best work. I don't know if you noticed it, but Jason Miller's running around like a ninja with a camera this morning. If you're interested in something like that, man, we need more people to help out on the creative side as well. So man, fill out a connect card, okay? That's the best way to jump in and serve. Fill out a connect card. And if this is your church, if Hope City is your church, and you're not serving yet, it's time to get off the bench and it's time to get in the game.
because we're serious about this. We want the world to experience Jesus in a way that changes their lives and impacts generations with his hope. That's why we exist, and it's time to go. All right, I want to do this as we get ready to close out. I want to invite up my friend Noah. Uh, Noah, come on up here, man. Noah's been around Hope City for about the last uh, eight months or so, and um, Noah's life was deeply impacted when he first walked in the door through team serving, like people just serving him. And uh, Noah, you, you now serve on team. So guys, would you uh, welcome Noah up here this morning? Thanks for having me up here. Yeah, uh, let me make sure what, here. Got you, dude. There, there you go. go. Yeah. Tech guy can't figure out a mic. Here yeah, that's all good. <laughs> so no, man, would you share with everybody? I know I, I know your story, but a little bit of how you came to Hope City. Yeah, so uh, I was raised in the church since, you know, I could basically crawl around um, and went through all the steps. Uh, and so once I got to college, you know, I kind of uh, didn't necessarily go to church that much. I was caught up in studies and whatever and uh, kind of found myself in a place where I just you know, I thought I, I knew it, you know, I'd been with Christ all my life and I was like, okay, yeah, I got it figured out. Yeah. Um, and so getting toward, uh, the end of graduation there, my dad actually reached out to me and he was like, Hey, uh, there's a new church plant popping up in Northwest Arkansas called the Hope City. There's this guy named Adam Barry, go get lunch with him. And literally that's essentially what he said. Yeah. Yeah, He literally just said, Hey, slapped us in a text message together and said, get to know each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so Adam and I went and got lunch. It was fantastic. Um, but again, I was kind of like, yeah, that's great. Like hope the church goes well, but you know, I got to figure it out. And so after graduation, you know, with that kind of pseudo confidence, um, I started to realize that I didn't have anything figured out whatsoever. And I was like, what am I missing? Um, and so I would talk to family members about it and I would pray and, Eventually, I realized, I was like, well, you know what I'm not doing? I'm not walking with God. I'm just acknowledging him, Mm. you know, and I realized that I needed to continue to take steps with him um, to really find that fulfillment in life. And so, that's good, man. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. And yeah, Yeah. January 29th of this year uh, showed up here. And since then, I mean... It's been amazing. Yeah. So, so when you walked in the doors for the first time at Hope City, you're trying to figure some stuff out about life and faith, and you're kind of coming back home, right? In instance. But, but what difference does somebody serving make in your life as you walked in the doors? So, the prime example I have is the moment I walked in the front door, uh, Miss Beth Fuller, who you guys have probably met a few times, <laughs> yeah. saw me walk in. <laughs> she, and she grabbed me by the arm like the sweetest mother you've ever met. And she was like, oh, you're new here? Well, let me show you around. And immediately I was just like, well, I'm home. Yeah. I was like, this feels incredible. Mm. And I had multiple people uh, reach out to me uh, that first day as well and uh, just really make me feel like I was in a place filled with not just other churchgoers, but family members. And so, yeah, it was that very first connection I made that kind of inspired me to stick around and also inspired me to start serving. Yeah. So you came to starting point back in January Mm -hmm. and then, um, out of that was like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and serve. Yeah. And and it was specifically your story because you told that to me over lunch and I was like, well, dude, do you want to do the same thing for other people? And so tell us how you serve right now. Yeah. So I, uh, am on city life team right now, just as a volunteer. Um, I kind of go here, there, and everywhere with yep. City Life. So yeah. you tell me to do something, and I'll drop what I have and do it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I uh, talk with uh, Jared a lot about that. He leads the City Life team. And uh, yeah, it's really that same feeling that Beth instilled in me that kind of drives me to serve and do the same for other people. Yeah. You know, if I can make them feel at home and provide them that sense of comfort. Yes. You know, that's what really makes me happy. Um, And, you know, I feel like that is kind of what walking with God is like Mm -hmm. and walking in Jesus's footsteps that he laid out for us is serving others to navigate this crazy thing we call life together uh, through Jesus's examples and lessons that he's provided for us. Yeah. And so what would you say to somebody that's, that's, you know, in here at Hope City, they're like, man, maybe they've only been here a couple weeks, but they love this church, but they're not sure if there's a spot for them to jump in yet, or they've been around for a long time, haven't served yet. 
what would you encourage them with Noah? Uh, well, first, like you've said multiple times today, starting point is a fantastic opportunity. You know, worst comes to worst, you get a free lunch out of it. That's so, right. <laughs> everybody loves a. And we've all been belly. to worst timeshare presentations. Let's yeah, be honest, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, there's no food there anyway. But uh, yeah, I would say starting point is a fantastic uh, place to start. And the other thing I tell you is that we're here with you the entire way. Is you're not going to show up to starting point and be alone in the corner. You know, you're going to find plenty of people who are in the exact same spot you are, same shoes, same boat, uh, who want to walk through this with you. Yeah. Uh, people who have only been coming here for a couple weeks to people who have been here since the beginning. Yeah. You know, they want to be there right beside you through the entire thing. Um, and that's what I found. Once I came to starting point, I immediately found people that... I mean, wanted to get to know me, welcome me into the family, and in just it was inspiring yeah. to step forward and continue walking and awesome. start serving. Awesome, man. Noah, hey, thank you for sharing with us a little bit. Guys, would you give up for Noah? Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Awesome. I'll be after All right, Hope City, let's, uh, let's wrap up here. I mean, um, like Noah shared, th this is a family. And we all do get to carry the weight. And you all know this, like, family's messy, isn't it? But we're created to, to share the load together, to serve each other. Not, not because it earns us a place in the family, but because we already are in the family, right? And when people who follow Jesus, who are in the family, start to live like Jesus, then the world gets to experience Jesus. And like Noah was sharing, it, it's changed his life. It changes our lives. And if you want to see this world transform, I'm telling you, I told you all the things the world doesn't need more of. It needs more Jesus. And, it, and the way the world gets to experience Jesus, it's not through him coming back because at that point it's too late. The, the way the world gets to experience Jesus is through people like you and me humbling ourselves, emptying ourselves, taking on the mindset of Christ, learning to love people the way that Jesus has loved us, and learning to serve. So we're going to go into our time of prayer that we do around here every week. And uh, the first question I want to ask is, um, man, where are you serving? Where are you giving your life away to somebody else? Because the thing that you're looking for, the way that you may grow spiritually is actually by humbling yourself, by pouring yourself out and allowing Jesus to meet you in that moment to give you the, the, the power and the ability to fulfill his good purpose for your life. And, and so I just want to encourage you to take a minute and ask him that during this time. And then maybe he's moving you a little bit. You're not sure how, but you're like, okay, Adam, you're right. I need to jump in. I, I want to be part of serving at Hope City. Fill out that connect card. We'll help you take your next step. All you have to do is take that first step in that direction. Drop it off in the back, and, and we'll help. We're with you. This is a family, right? And then the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to pass communion during this time. And, and communion is uh, an opportunity for you to take a little piece of bread and a cup of juice that represents everything that Paul just wrote about in Philippians 2. Jesus' mindset was aimed at you, and he came in your direction. He entered into your mess. Whatever that thing is, when you hear the word mess for your life, Jesus came into that, and his body was broken, and his blood was poured out so that you could be forgiven and set free from that, and so you could enter into a type of life that looks like who God created you to be, and so when you take communion, this is not something where you take that and you beat yourself up all morning, and you just take it and say, thank you. It's a gift. And then out of that, we go live like Jesus. Let's pray. God, thanks for today. Thank you for your good love and your grace. Thank you for uh, kind of a, a new start to the fall season, God, and uh, for all the people who will be selflessly pouring out their lives this fall uh, through teaching, uh, through being involved in kids' lives, through workplaces, parents that are giving to their kids like crazy through sports and taking them to school. And, and God, thank you for the opportunity that we have through this church community, like Noah said so well, uh, to model what it looks like to be part of your family. And uh, God, I just pray that right now this morning, you remind us of what's true about you and what's true about us so that we know how to take a step forward to look more like you, Jesus. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.